uh, just real briefly, at Easter of this last of this year, actually, we asked you guys what are some things that you would like to hear about, and we said that we would do a series called "You Asked for It," and we are wrapping that series up today, and we're going to be talking about finances, how we manage our resources, uh, what is the expectation from uh, the Lord for how we do that, and then just some practical steps on how to do that in our homes. And so I have the privilege of having my father-in-law and my pastor, Randy Williams, here with us today from Birmingham, Alabama. And he is no stranger. He has ministered here several times uh, before. Uh, Actually, annually, he's here pretty regularly. And so uh, I just want to say that this is his first time to be with us since he retired from uh, pastoring full-time in Birmingham. And so if you guys can make him feel welcome as he comes to bring the word. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Am I on? Okay. Hey, how's everybody? All right. Let's try that again. How's everybody? All right. Excellent. We're going to be taking a little journeys day in a very practical area of finances. This is not a teaching on how to get rich quick. This is not a teaching on what investments to make. This is a practical teaching on how to manage your resources. Uh, I want to start here with a scripture and I think I'm pulling this up. There it is. Uh, I'm just calling it Practical Principles for Managing Family Finances. And this scripture says in Proverbs 27, 23, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. Can we have a moment of prayer together? Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you. Every day we see your evidence in our lives and Thank you for how you impact us. And Lord, I just want to bless you for your word. Your word is truth. It sanctifies us. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Your word brings to us conviction. It brings to us courage and strength. And your promises are real and powerful. We love you and thank you for them. Guide us today. Holy Spirit, speak into our hearts and our lives. And we ask you to be honored in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, I want you to notice two things in this verse as we go down this practical step here. You need to know the state of your flocks. This is a reference to as if you were a shepherd overseeing some sheep. You need to know their condition and you need to attend to their needs. Back in the 1980s, Miss Diana and I, which uh, Miss Diana is sitting in the back with her brother Dan. Dan has been here before as well. But uh, Miss Diana and I celebrated this year 53 years of marriage. We've, yeah, that's awesome. Can you believe she put up with me that long? That's amazing. And uh, we're celebrating 57 years of ministry, I am, and uh, 51 years of pastoring. And I've stepped down from pastoral staff position, which means I don't go to the office. Some people think it means I don't do anything, but trust me, I'm still in ministry. I'm just not having to go take care of things at the church, which is, is kind of nice. Uh, but several years ago, we were pioneering a work. We were planting a church, and uh, we kept running out of money before we ran out a month. And so two months in a row, I remember that in order for my family, for my wife and my girls to eat, I had to fast the last day or the last two days of the month. Now, you look back at that, you say, oh, well, wasn't that nice of you? But at the time, I didn't feel it was very nice. At the time, I thought it was necessary. And I thought, something's not going right. And I'll tell you today, what was not going right is I was violating this scripture. I was not paying attention to it. And so I was not taking care of the needs that we had. I didn't understand the condition we were in. And I didn't know how to handle money. I didn't know, uh, you know, in my mind, I just needed more money. You probably thought that way too at times, if I could just make more money. Sometimes you need more, but sometimes you just need to manage what you have much better. And in our case, even though we were paid very little, we actually had enough if we managed it properly. And so I had to really learn. I remember sitting down, talking to the Lord and saying, Lord, how do I do this? There are other people who figured this out. I don't know, this is long before Dave Ramsey had any teaching on finances. And uh, I said, people figure this out. Surely you can help me do that. And uh, so I began this journey of trying to discover 
the wisdom that there is in managing money and what the Word of God tells us and everything that I want to give you and one recovery step just in case you've messed up. So principle number one is this. You cannot spend more than you bring in. I mean, you know that's obvious, right? I'm going to shock you in a minute, but as obvious as that sounds, most people don't do this. Most people miss this. And in a moment, I'm even going to change this statement, but I want you to catch it. If you're taking notes, you need to write this one down. You cannot spend more than you bring in. Why? It creates debt, and debt will control you, and debt will destroy you. I want you to understand that. Now, talking about bringing money in implies we have income. Here are seven legal God-honoring ways to receive money into your hands, into your household. One is through wages, that's working and being paid by somebody. Two is by inheritance. Three is by gifts, uh, whether it's Christmas or graduation or whatever it might be. Four is investments where your money is working for you. Number five is you finding money. The most I ever found at one time was $20. Who can beat that? Anybody ever find more than that? All right. I saw a hand. How much? 50? Is, I, I can't hear you. Did you say 50? I'm going to hang out with you. All right. Anybody else more than that? 100. Awesome. All right. We're hanging out with him. All right. Anybody else find 100? You did too? All right. Anybody more? All right. So it's not the best way to plan your finances, but you need a plan for even if you find money. Uh, selling assets, if you've ever sold a car, if you've ever sold uh, furniture, if you've ever sold, not your kids now, but if you've ever sold anything, uh, selling assets, sometimes you do that and say, hey, we've got to pay this bill, let's sell this, and we'll do that. If you've ever had a garage sale, you know what I'm talking about. I'm the kind of guy that, for all the work it takes for a garage sale, I'd rather donate it all down to the Salvation Army. My wife is going, but that's money. And so she'll, two days, do a garage sale and make all kinds of money, and I'd rather give it away. All right. The seventh is creative ideas. This is entrepreneurship. Maybe you have this idea that you can do something that will earn money. I was reading many years ago when our girls were young, uh, I was reading about this family, and they got to talking as a family unit. What could we do to help our kids raise money? And so dad taught the, the kids how to change the furnace filter. Said, I'll give you $5 if you'll buy the furnace filter and put it in every three months. And sometimes people change them every month. And so they said, okay, that's great. And uh, back then you could buy a furnace filter for 50 cents. And so they were making good money. And they said, do you think our neighbors would like that if we did that for them? Dad said, why don't you knock on the door and find out? The kids went from door to door. Hey, could we change your furnace filter? Uh, if you pay us $5, we'll change it whenever you want to, every month, every three months. And pretty soon they had several customers in the neighborhood and they kept track on a calendar. And so they were raising their own funds. That's a small idea. You may have a small idea. You may have a large idea, but God will bless your entrepreneurship and bring income to you. So in order to manage our money, we've got to have it coming in. Now, Deuteronomy 8.18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, and I want you to catch this, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. What I want you to catch from this is God did not say, I'm going to give you wealth. He said, I'm going to give you the ability the power to get it. It is there, but you've got to get it. It's much like farming. There are crops in the field, but if you don't harvest them, those crops will just go and be destroyed. The power, the ability to harvest them brings that into your storehouse. God says, look, I will give you the ability to get wealth. Now, never confuse wealth and riches. Riches is a comparative thing. Uh, I might tell you my net worth and you might laugh and say, well, pfft, I've got much more than that, so I'm richer than you. Or you may say, wow, I don't have that much, you're richer than me. But never confuse wealth. Wealth is getting what you need to take care of life. So here you are, and the next thing you need is ABC, 
and God says, you need that, I'll give you the ability to get that. I'm not just going to hand it to you, but I'm going to give you the ability to get what you need. And as you get what you need, you can trust me every single day. I believe that's one reason we're told by the Lord to pray this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. He's not teaching us to pray to get just enough to get by, but God, what I need today, I'm asking you to bring it to me. Help me. I know you'll give me the ability to get it. Give me that opportunity. So I want to encourage you to understand the scripture when it says that he will give you that ability. The only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. Always remember that. A survey found that 83% of Americans say they overspend each month. Remember, here's what we're working on. You cannot spend more than you bring in. Yet four out of five people when surveyed said, I do that every month. And some will say, well, what we need is a family budget, okay? Among those with a household budget, 84% say they exceed it. And almost half of them use a credit card to make up the difference. Now, suppose at the end of the month, you're $50 short, and you do that every month. So at the end of the year, you're $600 short. At the end of 10 years, you're in debt $6,000. At the end of of 20 years, you're in debt $12,000, and it's just growing and growing and growing, and you can't get out of it. But what if you didn't go in debt? What if you didn't spend more than you brought in? What if you understood the state of your flocks and you attended to them so that you kept yourself out of debt? Principle number two, you will be in financial trouble if you spend more than 60% of your gross income. Now, I told you, you cannot spend more than you bring in. So a lot of people get this idea, okay, I bring in $100, I can't spend $101, I'm good if I only spend $100. No, you're already in trouble. Actually, all you can ever really spend out of your money is 60% of it. I'll tell you why in a moment. But I want you to catch this. I want you to understand how important it is that if you're spending more than 60%, you're setting yourself up for financial trouble. I'll tell you why in a moment. But we're going to talk about how to prioritize your cash flow very quickly. Okay? First of all, you need to be a tither. Now, I'm not going to debate with you whether tithing is for believers or not. That's a theological debate. That's fine. I'm going to let people handle that. I'm not going to get into that argument. I'm going to practice what I believe God wants me to do. But I will share this with you. Tithing was not first mentioned under the law. That's always the argument. Well, tithing was under the law. That's right. It was. But it was first mentioned as an act of worship. Before the law, before any requirement, Abraham freely from his heart to honor God gave him a tenth of all that he had, and God blessed him. Now, God did put it under the law, and he told them, that tithe is mine. Don't put your hand on it. If you put your hand on it, you'll be cursed. We need to understand God's blessing comes upon honoring him first. Now, I've put up here Malachi 3.10, but I want to read the whole passage to you. Here it is. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Why were they cursed? Because under the law, the law given to them, they were required to do it. They were absolutely disobedient to God. They were therefore under a curse because if you don't obey the law, you're under the curse of that law. But I want you to see what God then says. His blessing comes, what he does when you do tithe. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of of heaven's armies, I will open the winds of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't be able, you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Then he goes on and says this, and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightsome land. So what God is saying here, I've got these three blessings for those who will honor me, number one. The windows of heaven will be opened, and you will have uncontainable blessings. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of blessing I want to have. That'd be a good place to say amen. (laughs) All right. I want the kind of blessings that overflow. 
I want the kind of blessings that I can't just hold in a hand, but God just blesses. Now, here's the problem. Most people make a mistake by putting dollar signs in the middle of bless. B-L-E, dollar sign, dollar sign. God didn't say all your blessings would be financial. (coughs) In fact, the greatest blessings in life are not financial. And I want access to all of those blessings, so I want to honor God first with my substance. That's why I'm sharing with you, if you want to prioritize your budget, your income, if you want to set it up right, honor God first. Give him the first tenth part. He said the devourer will be stopped so you can prosper. (coughs) Excuse me. Satan will take his hands off of your family, off of your life, off of your possessions if you will honor God. And others will call you blessed as they see your God-given benefits. I have never found an unhappy tither. I've never found people who walk with God and are generous in their hearts. I've never seen them walk around in the mully grubs. They're always joyful. And others say, I want some of what you got. Second thing, taxes. You got to pay them. (coughs) 25% or less. 25% or less. Now, I would love to tell you that last year I paid $50,000 in taxes. Why would I love to tell you that? I didn't, by the way. Well, why would I love to tell you that? It would mean I made a lot of money, wouldn't it? So don't be upset that you have to pay taxes. That's the rent you pay for the benefits you get living in a country. But I want you to understand this. The tax code in America has 6,871 pages. (coughs) When you add to that all the regulations and all the guidelines, it goes up to 75,000 pages. That is 3.7 million words. It would take you 14 weeks to read through that, reading every minute of every day. But here's what I want you to get. Of the 6,871 pages, 5,871 pages tell you how not to pay your taxes. A thousand tell you what you owe. In other words, here's what you owe, here's how not to pay it. Most people don't understand that, so they always talk about loopholes. Listen to me very carefully. There are no loopholes in taxes. Either you have to pay it or you get out of it. And if, if you get out of it and people don't like it, they call it a loophole, but it's a legitimate way not to pay those taxes. I do this in premarital counseling. When I'm with a couple, we're talking family finances. <coughs> Excuse me. Could somebody bring me just some water? I would appreciate that. When, when I'm talking to a couple, we're talking family budget and everything, I tell them, this is how taxes work. Suppose you're renting a house from me, and it's $1,000 a month, but I say to you, if you own a goldfish, I'll knock off $100 off of those, that rent. How many of you would go buy a goldfish that day? You would spend that 50 cents or $1.50, and, and you'd... $10 on a, on a bowl, and, and you put the water in it, you put that fish in there, see, and you take the $100 off. Pastor, thank you so much. You're so kind. <coughs> Taxes are like that. They say you owe this much, but then if this happens, you don't owe it. And if this happens, you don't owe it. This happens, you don't owe it. Those who know how to pay less tax understand what to do in order to get the deductions and the credits and everything. So you need to be wise and learn how to do this. (coughs) Excuse me. The third thing. Hey, thank you very much. That's funny because you know what? When I'm preaching at home, somebody brings me a cough drop every time. I'm not sure. Maybe I cough a lot. You got more of those? Those are good. (laughs) You need to be saving money up front. This is one thing I didn't understand because my thought was at the end of the month, I'll save. But you know what? I never got there. I never had anything. (coughs) So we were never putting anything aside. Minimally, at the least, you should save 5%. At the most, you should pay 25% in taxes. I hope you're paying less. At the least, you should pay 5%. If you cut down your taxes by 5%, put it over here and save 10%. But here's what you save for. You save for emergencies. 
You save for future purchases. You save for investments. So emergencies can happen to anybody. Everybody's going to have some kind of financial emergency. The car breaks down, a child gets sick, whatever happens. Future purchases, you learn to buy the best at the best time and get the best buy. Don't just go out and buy something. My stepdad was so bad at doing this. When he would go buy a car, his, all he wanted to know is how much down and how much a month. Well, if you're a car salesman, you want to talk to him because you don't have to dicker over the price. You can just say, let me tell you now, this car is a $10,000 car and you can have it for 250 down and 250 a month for this month, number of months. And my stepdad would look at my mom and go, can we do that? And she'd say, yes. And they'd buy the car. They never talked about price. I would tell him, listen, let me go and negotiate for you. No, I don't want to deal with that. I just want to know how much down, how much a month. He never got the best buy. In fact, one time they went to buy a car and he ended up buying two cars because he could afford both payments. Okay, so you want to save for your future purchases so that you're getting the best buy and also you're not getting in debt. You can pay cash for it. And then investments, you need to save for investments. Did you know in your 20s, if you start investing $100 a month, by the time you're 45, you could retire with millions of dollars if you invested, say, in mutual funds or whatever because of the power of compound interest. But if we don't save first, we'll put it to the last and we'll run out before we can save it. The next area, and this is that 60% area I'm talking to you about, because you should be honoring God with 10%. You should pay your taxes up to 25%. You should be saving, that's 5%. You only have 60% left to spend money on. That includes housing, transportation, personal care, food, health insurance, entertainment, and so much more. Birthday presents, haircuts, whatever it might be, needs to come out of this 60% that's left. See, when I talk to most people and I say, how much can you spend? They say, this is a trick. You're a pastor. So I'm supposed to say 90%. Give God 10% and I can spend 90. Nope. You've already messed up. The government's going to get that other percentage for taxes and you need to be setting aside savings. You should only spend 60% of your money. Hopefully right now, some of you are thinking, all right, I bring home this much, 60%, am I in that bracket? Because that's where your safety zone is in family budgeting. That means if you owe credit cards, if you owe charges, if you owe loans, you're in this uh-oh area. Because for each of these, it reduces that 60% available money. Now, most people, instead of taking it out of the 60, they go back and say, well, I can't save the 5%, I gotta pay these bills. Well, I can't honor God with my money because I owe these bills. And I, it's funny how people reason this way. It was either eat or give my tithe. We've never been that way in our household. It was never us eating or giving our tithe. It was giving our tithe, and if I have to fast, then I'll fast. If I die of starvation, I'm dying in starvation for the glory of God. I'm gonna take care of God, I'm gonna honor God first. And you know what God promised in his word? If you honor him with your substance, he'll honor you with his blessings. We found that out. God didn't just give me money, he taught me how to manage what I had, then he began to increase. Why would I give you more money if you're gonna waste it? Why would you give your kids more money? You pay them an allowance on Friday of $5, let's say, and by Saturday morning it's gone, and on Monday they're going, hey, can you give me more money? And you say, no, you gotta wait till next Friday. Why? Because you wasted it. Now, I'm gonna really go way back, go way, way back to a time, and understand it was years ago, that's first of all, and secondly, we didn't have much money. Our kids were little, and we could afford to give them 15 cents a week for allowance. So we gave them three nickels. You may have heard me tell this story. Carmen, our youngest, uh, she, she had the hardest time because she felt like if you had money, you had to spend it. And so we had to teach her that, you know, you need to save. But we gave them three boxes and we said one nickel goes in the God box, one nickel goes in the spend box, and one nickel goes in the save box every week. Our middle daughter, Melissa, she built up that save box. She would never spend. 
She had tons of nickels. Our oldest daughter, Nancy, she did really good. She honored God with her God box, and then she would save up her money and buy something, and, and then she would keep this over here for some long-term thing. But Carmen, her save box was always empty. Her spin box was always empty. And then she'd come over here to the God box, and she would take it to church every Sunday. And one Sunday she said, do I have to give this? And we said, yes, because we're parents right? And uh, yes, you have to do that. And she'd reluctantly learn to do that. But what we were doing, it wasn't about the amount of money. It was about the habit we were establishing in their life. Honor God, know what you need to spend, and save for the future. This is an amazing thing. Every time you pay on your credit purchases, you're taking money away from your spendable money, whether it's credit cards, store charges, doctor bills, personal loans, and so on. Only borrow to buy your house. Well, pastor, what about if I had need a car? Well, you may have to borrow to buy a car, but if you can work it out long term, learn how to drive an older car, save some money, put money aside, and when you need to upgrade, pay cash for it. You know, pastor, I really appreciate you, but you don't sound very practical. That's not the world we live in. I know, the world we live in lives in debt. 80% of people overspend their budget. That's what I'm trying to counter today and share with you how to be financially free. Third principle, understand that debt will enslave you. Proverbs 22, verse 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. You need to avoid debt by paying cash for everything. You need to understand that when you borrow money, you become obligated. And when you're obligated, you now don't have that sense of peace and freedom. You need to avoid these purchases. First of all, impulse purchases. Impulse, that's the stuff they put by the cash register. I wasn't going to get that candy bar, but it was right there. I wasn't going to get that Dr. Pepper, but it was right there. I wasn't going to buy this new wire to plug in my devices, but it was right there. And it said it was on sale. Avoid impulse buying. Secondly, avoid pressure buying. If you've ever had a salesman pressure you, you know what I'm talking about. They will guilt you into making you feel like if you don't get this, you don't love your family. If you don't get this, you're not up to date with everybody. Pretty soon under pressure, we'll commit to buying something. And especially don't buy things you can't afford. Walk away when you can't do it. One time we needed a car and they didn't have the kind of car that we needed to have. And, and this guy said, well, I can sell you this. I just got this in. This is a great deal. And I said, how much you want for it? And he told me. We talked. I said, look, I don't want this car. Well, what would it take for you to get this car? Nothing, because I don't want it. Yeah, but what would it take? I said, it'd have to be a steal on my part. Well, make me an offer. So we talked and talked and got down. I talked him to 50% of the price of the car. He said, now will you take it? I said, no, I told you up front, I don't want the car. I just want to see how low you would go. Learn to not buy things you can't afford. Learn not to yield to pressure and learn not to live in impulse buying. Principle number four, use a budget to track your finances, your cash flow. Remember to divide it this way, 10% tied to God, 25% taxes, 5% savings, 60% living, 0% credit. Now, the first thing you do when you lay out your budget is find out what am I doing with credit and pay off those bills. No, not that day one, you can't do that but devise a plan whereby you pay them off. Years ago, when I was on staff in Kansas City at church in, in the city where we grew up, a fellow came to me, and he was very well-to-do. He, he made good money, and uh, both he and his wife worked and had good cash flow, but he was in debt. And he brought to me 21 credit bills they owed, 21, every month. And I said, how are you paying this? He said, I'm not. I'm not paying this at all. He said, I pay some one month, I pay some another month, I pay some another month, and I'm getting letters from everybody. I said, well, I understand. You owe this, and you're not paying. That's why they're contacting you. And he said, I don't know what to do. I'm buried. I said, no, we can get out of this. So I devised a plan for him how to pay every one of these off. And I said, now I want you to write a letter to each one of these people you owe and explain to them, uh, I haven't been paying you faithfully, but I've gotten some financial counseling. I'm going to be paying you this much money every month this long and it'll be paid off and I guarantee you 
the letters will quit coming as long as you keep this commitment. They'll put it in your file and they'll hold you accountable to it. So we devised this plan, come to find out that not only did he have enough money to pay these, but he wasn't managing his resources. He wasn't attending to the state of his flocks. So he didn't know he was wasting money and therefore he didn't have money to pay this. Once we got him set up on a budget, he paid those off, got out of debt, everything was fine. I talked to another couple and um, they had, had uh, talked about how in debt they were, they couldn't pay anything. And so I went through their bills and set them up on a budget, got them where they were gonna pay everything. They got financially free and they said, now we need to talk to you about something else. Said, okay. So we have uh, some bills left over from when we lived in Iowa. I said, what do you mean? He said, I have 42 bills I didn't pay in Iowa. That's why we left the state and we came here. I said, well, what do you wanna do? He said, I'd like to pay those off. So we set up a plan where he could pay those off. It's amazing what you can do once you know the state of your flocks, once you understand what you need to do. Now, you get out of debt and then you start honoring God, then you start uh, learning how to do taxes, you get your living and you make sure that you save up what you need to save. Well, what if I've already blown it? What if, what if you've already messed up? What if you find yourself in a situation like we found ourselves? We don't know what's going on. We're not, we don't have enough money. We're not getting to the end of the month. Uh, we're part of those four out of five people that's spending all the time over our budget. Uh, we don't know how to get the best buy. We don't know how to get started and getting out of debt. We don't know. What if you've done that? Well, first of all, don't condemn yourself. Recognize you're in the 80% of Americans, okay? Don't beat up yourself. Don't act like you're stupid and you don't know because you really do know you just need a little help. Thank you. Welcome to a big club. Here's what I'm going to suggest to you. Stop getting further in debt. Don't keep buying stuff on credit. Second, get totally honest about your money management. You got to be honest enough that you can be honest with yourself. Say, you know what? I'm not doing this right. I'm not handling things the way I should. I really don't have a good grasp of what I need to do. I need help. Third, plan your recovery strategy. Now, that's where generally you need somebody that can talk to you. By the way, I'm stop right here. I'm not selling anything today. I'm not asking you to buy a course. I'm not gonna ask you to buy a book. I'm not here to say, we've come to this part now where I tell you about my plan. And for $99.99, you know, or today for $19.99, but wait, that's not all. We're not doing that. I'm here giving you free advice because I don't have any of that stuff to sell. Plan your recovery. If you can't do it alone, get some help. Ask somebody. Uh, set up counsel with somebody. Buy a book that will instruct you, but be honest with yourself. Move that way and forth. Live out the plan that you choose. Here's my recommendation to you. And again, I'm not selling anything. I don't even kick back from Dave Ramsey. I recommend you take Dave Ramsey's financial peace course. And I understand from Pastor Jim that City Church is planning to offer that next year. I didn't know that when I was preparing my stuff. But as soon as all that's laid out, you need to sign up and just say, you know what? I want to be honest. I just need some help. I need some insight. I just need some, some guidance going forward. I would encourage you to... to uh, sign up for his course and also implement his baby step strategy, which are like this. Step one, save $1,000. I'm not going to teach on this. I'm just going through it real quickly. Uh, number two, pay off uh, debt. Uh, number three, develop a three to six month fund. Uh, number four, invest. Number five, college. Uh, save for college. Number six, pay off your house. Number seven, which didn't show up, is give like you've always wanted to give. I encourage you to go and do something uh, like this to help yourself. Now, I'm at the end of what I'm sharing with you today. I hope you found some practical things. I wanna review a couple of things with you very quickly, okay? I reminded you from scripture that God wants us to understand where we're at, wants us to know uh, what we have and how to manage it. That's in Proverbs. I shared with you also that God says he's the one who gives us the ability to get wealth. I'm here, I have a need, God, help me to know how to move forward. Number three, I've shared with you that God puts blessing upon our tithe when we give to him from our hearts. I shared with you also that the scripture teaches us 
that debt makes us servants, makes us slaves, makes us servants to those we owe, and God wants us to keep us out of debt. It is possible in all of the stuff going on in America and all the credit push and everything, it's possible to live without that. Uh, I tell people, people say, I need a good credit score. Why? Because I want to borrow money. What if you didn't need to borrow money? Would you need a big credit score? No, you wouldn't. And it's amazing. You get a good credit score because you get in debt. Isn't that incredible? If you stay out of debt, your score goes down. My score has been over, I won't tell you, but it's been real high. And we started cutting up credit cards that we don't need. We always used them, paid them off at the end of the month. We decided not to do that anymore. And every time you cut a credit card out, your score drops down. And I'm thinking, wow, isn't that incredible? They're rewarding your ineptitude rather than rewarding your success. Well, why don't we get over on God's side and say, God, what do you want? I want to honor you. I want to do what you say. All right. If I've helped you today, praise God. God bless you. If you already knew this, I'm just reiterating it for you. If you need any help, if you need counsel, please see Pastor Jim. And uh, uh, I'm sure that they'll direct counsel your way. Uh, I'd love to come back sometime. I'm, I'm here a lot, so I'm not trying to invite myself back. But I'd love to come back sometime and even just sit around and just talk. Hey, here's how we can help you. Can I do this with you as we come to a close? Let me ask you this question, unrelated to the finances. And I just want to say thank God for the opportunity. And thank you, Pastor Jim, for the invite to talk on some practical things. Because I believe that while Jesus saved me, forgave me of my sin, made me a citizen of heaven, has a home for me in eternity, and I'm going to be with him forever. He didn't take me home immediately. He left me here to live right now. And I believe he gives us insight and teaching on how to live victoriously here. And I believe this is part of that victorious living to stay out of debt, to stay financially free, and to be able to do what God wants us to do. Now, I'm moving from that, and I want to ask you a question just before I pray with you. If you're here today and you don't have confidence, God forbid something should happen to you today and you would die. If you don't have confidence that you'd go to heaven, I would ask you this question, how confident are you God would let you into heaven? If you don't have that confidence, can I tell you, you'll never have it without Christ in your life. If he is in your life, you'll have confidence because he's the only savior. But if you don't have him, there won't be confidence that you'll go to heaven. Could I ask you this to just bow your heads with me, every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment here. And if that's you and you don't have confidence, would you look at your relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you ever said, Lord, I surrender to you. I give my heart to you. I ask you to come into my life and forgive me my sin. I believe you are my Lord and my Savior. If you have never done that, as we just take this moment, I invite you to pray that prayer to Jesus right now. He will hear you. On the authority of his word, I tell you, he will forgive you. He will bring you the gift of eternal life. He'll come into your life, and you get a brand new start with him today. If that's you, I'm asking you to pray that prayer between you and God right now. And afterwards, would you just come up and, and see me or see Pastor Jim and say, hey, I prayed that prayer today. I'm beginning a new life in Christ. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for instruction today. I thank you for your blessing. Ask God that you would watch over us and bless us at every turn. We believe, Lord, you are for us and not against us. We believe, God, that you're helping us and not hindering us. We believe, God, that you have blessing for us and not curse. We believe, God, that you have a great, great uh, plan for our lives, and we desire to walk in it and honor you in Jesus' name. Let everybody say a good amen. Amen. Can you give the Lord a good hand of praise today? Amen. Thank you, Pastor Andy. Uh, I want to take a moment and introduce, you probably saw as you walked in that we had a little sign in the walkway that says uh, Acts of Kindness on it. And today we're, we're launching, uh, heading into the holidays, a, a just a plan of action for our church to be intentional about blessing others, finding ways to do small things that make an impact in other people's lives. Uh, and we're also picking up the Sit With Me campaign where uh, you are, uh, we're asking people to not just come to church, but come and sit with me and let me be with you and be your host at church. And so there are little cards that are in that uh, sign as you're coming 
out as you're heading out the door today. You can pick up some of those. Uh, if you do a random act of kindness, you can leave that card for them and let them know why you did it, uh, what the purpose of it was. Uh, there are so many things that we can do to impact the world around us. Uh, and I was having a conversation with a, a gentleman yesterday about, uh, the, about the poor, right, and, and the need to help the poor. And we can very easily in our culture and society go, well, you know, that's, that's the government's responsibility. But that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that we'll always have the poor with us, but we are to help the least of these. And so I see it as my responsibility when I identify a need, if I'm able to, to figure out how can I help in this way. And so as we're stepping into the holiday season, you guys are going to be chowing down on turkey and ham and uh, brisket or whatever your tradition is this week. And you're going to be gathering with friends and family Let's step into the next few weeks thinking about how we can be a blessing to others. It doesn't have to be huge. We're not like trying to get everybody to give a car away, but maybe you just pay for somebody's meal. Maybe you uh, help uh, another family that doesn't have the resources to get gifts for their kids, to put a few gifts under the tree. Go above and beyond in the coming months, and let's build a culture of being kind to the people around us. Uh, and the only way that you can do that, right, if you're sitting here thinking, man, I, I don't know how I could do that. Like, I, can, I, I, I can't afford that. Well, then step back to what Pastor Rennie was talking about and figure out how to manage your resources so that you can. I'm always reminded of a prayer that Jacob made in the Old Testament, and he said, you know, Lord, give me the, the resources I need to be able to eat, to be able to have clothes on my back, and I will steward them so that I can bless you, right? He says, I'll give back unto you. And I think that's a really great place to start. Lord, if, if you're struggling, Lord, help me to be able to have the resources I need to handle the necessities in my life, and then I'll be committed to be a blessing back and be a blessing back. Um, tithe, invest in the local church, invest in your local community and beyond. We love you guys. I hope you have fun this week with family. We're not gonna be doing prayer Wednesday night or youth services. We encourage you to be doing all those last minute preps to be with family, and we will see you guys next Sunday. Until then, go change your world. We love you guys.